What is going on, YouTube family? It is your favorite entrepreneur turned techie, Sarah Nicole, and we are back with a, another video. Now, in today's video, we are going to talk about what it means to be a product manager and a product owner. These are careers that if you are someone who is a visionary and you're someone who is a creative, you have the potential to make an average of over $100,000 as a product manager or a product owner. And so today we have a super special guest, Deshaun, to come on and talk to you about his experience with this tech industry and being a product manager, what is possible for you and how you can break into it yourself. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button before we dive into today's interview. Well, Deshaun, I really appreciate you for hopping on and, and chatting with me today. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. I've been following you on Twitter for a while. Um, and you know, we've interacted every now and then on there. And um, I was, I saw some of the different things that you were doing with, it was Solana, right? Yeah, Solana, Solana yeah. Block. Yes. And so um, I was really just curious to learn more about what you do. And I'm sure someone watching will be able to gain some value from it and some insight. Um, because as you guys know, with the videos that I've been posting as of recently, um, my goal is just to really share what's possible in the technology field. I feel like there's a lot of gatekeeping at times and you only hear about you know, certain roles in tech like tech sales and project management, which is awesome, but there's so much more that you can do, which is why I wanted to bring Deshaun on here. Um, so Deshaun, you know, it's my first time being able to actually talk to you. So tell me a little bit just about your professional background and where you're from. Yeah. Super happy to be here and I love this. A little bit about me, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I now live in Baltimore, Maryland. Never thought I would live here, but here we are. Um, my professional background is quite of an interesting story. You know, I, I started off as somebody who never thought that I would end up in tech at all. And I think the ultimate indicator of, you know, me going down this path was my curiosity just being so piqued by it. So quickly, back in high school, I had saw these, these people in this like dark room. This is like 2006, 2007. Never seen them before. They're typing on you know, these keyboards, computers. I'm like, hey, I just walk in the room. What are you guys doing? And they're like, you know, we're programming, HTML, CSS, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what is that? What are you You're talking gibberish to me right now. And um, they explained it. The next thing I know, I signed up for the class. And through that, it took me on this beautiful journey that's led me to be you know, an intern at Microsoft in college. Uh, straight out of college, I ended up at a uh, startup making zero dollars, working with HR technology and software, building some really cool matching um, platforms. And then from that, I actually ended up at a nonprofit called Riverside Technology, uh, Riverside Institute, Riverside Center for Innovation. That's what it's called. It's been a little bit. So Riverside Center for Innovation, uh, we we're a nonprofit that helped minority veterans, women owned businesses to excel with their blue collar work and companies such as construction, uh, things like that, helping them get federal contracts um, and starting from zero and turning those ideas into full fledged businesses that pay the bills. And, you know, something that always had piqued my interest was blockchain technology. Crypto was something I followed since 2011. And I think back uh, in 2020, 2021 is when I really got the itch to dive into the industry full time. And so I made that switch uh, to a company called Metaplex. And they were essentially the creators of what we would call the NFT standard. So that thing is essentially what all these developers and projects use to build a top of these NFTs uh, in the Solana blockchain. And that's something that I just currently reside in now as a consultant. Uh, I own my own business called Web3 Products uh, Studios and um, or Web3 Product Group. Sorry, I have so many names and acronyms in my head. And uh, that's just kind of where I am today. Right. That's awesome. So can you tell me what is Web3? Because there might be someone who's watching like who doesn't know what that is. I know it's a I think it's a more common term now, but I think it's still very lightly used, especially if you're not, if you're very new to the technology space. So what is that? You know, Web3 is an idea. Um, I would say when we, when we go back in time and look at Web 1.0, that's where you would have the Netscapes of the world, AOL, getting that internet disk 
in the mail for, for a lot of you people who might be a little bit younger, we, we had dial up and uh, it was very slow and we would get a free trial of the internet via CD put in our computer. Um, and then I would say Web 2.0 was really when we started to see, so Web, web 1.0 was really the infrastructure, the, the beginnings of the internet, the beginnings of these um, digital connections that we could establish with people it was like right, this brand new frontier. And Web 2.0, I would say, was really the beginnings of what we see today with our social media communities. It was establishing those peer-to-peer -peer relationships and communities. And we had these financial infrastructures, these financial rails that were also built with a lot of these centralized uh, entities or companies. So what do I mean by centralized? Essentially, it is a company that is enabling a certain product to exist, but you as a consumer or a user, you don't really know what's happening behind the curtain, right? They kind of just have everything in this black box and you only see what they want you to see. Now with Web3, we take that a little bit further and we, we were standing on the shoulders of giants. So all of the foundation I was laid in 1.0 and all of the innovative new social communities and financial products and things of that nature that were, that were built in Web 2.0, we're able to, in Web 3, have those same communities, have those same uh, infrastructure and financial rails, but now with a lot more um, clarity and transparency. So in Web 3, we can see behind the curtain we know how much a certain company has in a bank. We know what they're spending things on. We know when transactions are going in and out. And that's all due to this idea of the blockchain, which is essentially an open ledger. Or let's say if you looked at the transaction history of your bank account, but for everybody and for every entity, right? It's just all public information. So Web3 is really about transparency and ownership as well yeah do you see people embracing that more with so much transparency or is there ever a concern of like privacy because i know that's a big thing as well right now with um like cybersecurity and trying to protect your information and your data so like what like is there pushback there or what is that like that's a good question and i think what's really cool about just this whole paradigm of web3 is it emphasizes choice now, there are areas in which open finance and a lot of transparency is in place to see what's happening on a bunch of different places with a bunch of different projects. But there are also tools to keep certain things private on chain, right? So even though you have this open ledger that nobody can change, mind you, nobody can manipulate and you know, essentially lie to you, um, there are tools in place that allow for you to make things private and you can keep some of those things confidential. And of course, there are still aspects of blockchain technology that rely on you know, Web2 infrastructure. So you'll have something you know, sort of in a database off to the side and you can keep sort of the normal routines and practices that you have today with managing your safety and keeping your data, um, you know, to yourself, in a sense. Okay, that makes sense. So there is that element of choice where you know, if you want, if they want it to be out there, it will be. But it's not something that you can just make up. Like I guess on today's internet, you can pretty much just put anything, and there's no proof that it's real. <laughs> yeah, facts. And you know, I, I think it's very interesting, right? Because you have a lot of people who are scammers or you know they they say that they've done things that they haven't and the interesting thing about web3 I know that I worked with a company who did a lot of um, they're trying to be like the upwork of web3 right and it allows what they're enabling for companies to be uh, a lot more trusting that the developers or you know other professionals who are on this platform um, to be 
who they say they are to be and to have done the work that they say they have done. And that is due to just the openness of building on the blockchain and you know what that project you know is able to leverage with that technology so now they're able to build these you know verifiable credentials if you will right so to go back to your your, your last question a little bit you know there is some pushback in some areas but i think what's really cool is you know we always enable this freedom of choice in a lot of different areas in web3 and the other cool thing is if there is something that that isn't right or doesn't sit well with people everything's open there's a lot of open source uh, a lot of ways that people can contribute so a random developer from romania can just say hey i don't like how that's being done so i'm going to create this thing push it to wherever it needs to go and now people have a choice to you know make things private or keep things you know public right and it's just this huge community of people that are contributing um, without asking anybody's permission is super cool you know and that is really interesting just seeing the the way the fu- the way of the future you know because obviously you know the internet and technology is just ever evolving so it's just so interesting to really see it happening in real time um, because you know like when like you said w- uh, web was at 1.0 with like dial up all of that came out you know um, a lot of us some of some people but a lot of us weren't necessarily in it when it was happening and so being able to see web 3 kind of um, sprout from the ground up in real time is really cool to see um, but I, I'm curious so you're with Metaplex right so I actually was with Metaplex before okay. Um, and I experienced the layoff. And so as soon as I had went through that, I had started my own business and, you know, it's, it's almost been a year since I started this business and yeah, yeah, yeah. but I was. Okay. And you, you were a product owner or product manager? So I was a product manager, uh, okay. but I sort of served in a little bit of a function of a product owner as well. And just for, you know, clarification to anybody out there, you know, the product manager, they own, uh, you know, essentially the roadmap, they own uh, the insight that they gather from the market and what issues your customers are actually facing the users. They're essentially the advocate for those users and they use the, the skill sets that they have to gather market intelligence and insight to um, accurately assess if the problem could be addressed with you know, what the company has to offer in terms of resources, and they build a compelling case to take it to their uh, superiors or, you know, other peers in the company to go about building something to address that uh, sort of at a high level. It's a little bit more intricate than that, but yeah, they're problem solvers and they're, you know, people who corral the company internally to uh, rally around a problem and a solution. And then on the other side, on when it comes to a product owner, they, you know, they typically work with the engineering team a little bit more when it comes to, you know, they have these issues or let's say a particular feature or bug that needs to be addressed on the technical side, the product owner will prioritize and manage sort of that backlog of tasks that need to be addressed and send them out to the team, the technical team, which is typically the engineers or even designers. And they'll say, hey, this is what we need to be working on to get, you know, to reach our goal and to ship what we need to ship. So a product manager can really serve in a lot of those different functions. Um, And then a product owner really just focuses on that specific sort of uh, niche. So, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Um, in In your experience, what type of skills did you have to have in order to land that type of role? You know what's crazy? I I had been doing this for such a long time, but at the at the onset of my career, I had no idea that a product manager was even a thing, right? Right. So I had actually talked to uh, Tanika Skew. I know a lot of people see her on Twitter. We had a call like you know some time ago and. She was like, oh, you really sound like a product manager. I was like, what's that? 
so to answer your question, you know, I did a I did a gap analysis on myself, right? I was I was like, okay, let me research what a product manager actually is and does, and I was noticing the the, the, the skill sets that I lacked, that were you know really prevalent in a lot of those uh, positions that I saw, job descriptions and things of that nature, other people on LinkedIn, and the common the common themes that I saw was okay. Are you a good leader? Do you have leadership qualities, right? Are you a good communicator, both vocally and written? Because as product managers, we write a lot, we talk a lot. And I think another intrinsic thing is inherently you need to be a people person, but on the, on the sort of flip side of that, you also need to know how to manage people either down at your level and also you have to manage up, right? And so those things really culminate the essence of a product manager. And then on the sort of hard skills, there are dozens of different things that you'll see out there. Like, okay, a product manager has to know how to use JIRA or Confluence, which is essentially a project manager tool. Or you need to learn how to you know, use monday.com or Notion or things of that nature. And it just varies from company to company. But the other things that you would have to be really good at are research, right? And you need to develop a sense of how can you go out, look at this issue and come up with a you know game plan to cultivate information from different resources that are the right resources and it's the right information and then formulate a compelling, you know, um, argument for why this problem and then also you know come up with in, in ideas within yourself that you think can best address those issues based on the resources that your company has and the capacity that you all have and what the market is ready for so you also need to be a great idea person a great negotiator and you need to be a great storyteller as well because you're doing a lot of presentations, a lot of meetings. So those are some of the skills that just come off the top of my head. And uh, yeah. And you know, it's interesting because that seems like such a, a very pivotal role in a company, right? Um, yeah. Because you're almost like kind of driving the direction of where the product is going pretty much right you is is it usually like a solo person or are there multiple people that you're working with to to drive that or is it really just you yeah that's a great question so it's actually both right so what i what do i mean by it's both when it comes to a product manager actually getting a sign off on you know presenting an idea and being able to build something based on that research that they did, it takes a lot of buy-in. So what does that look like? You shop and socialize the ideas that you have around to the team. So you have to be very collaborative, right? So it's a solo endeavor at first with you cultivating all of this stuff to build that case up for whatever you're trying to do and then you're getting the documents together, making sure you know it's the right information and you're presenting it the right way. And then you're working with your cross-functional team that can consist of engineers, designers, you know, QA, data science, et cetera. And then also management, leadership, legal, marketing, blah, 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 right? And you're connecting with all of these different people depending on the company, right? Because your company could be a startup and you have certain key figures that you need to get this by, or you're at a big corporation, it's just gonna take a lot longer and you need more people um, to, to, to be bought into this to get the go ahead. So there, there's both sides of that, um, that you can, you can kind of expect. Right. And it, I mean, it seems like it's a, which correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a highly creative Role. Like you have to have that somewhat creativity or that, you know, like to like innovation um, to be in a role like that. Would you agree? 100%. One of the, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, uh, I remember 
wanting to be a, a Disney Imagineer so bad. That was that was my dream job. And I would akin or liken a product manager to a Disney Imagineer. You 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 definitely have to be creative and you have to build this sort of product muscle, right? To where you you can find yourself, you know, in any given situation when it comes to being a product manager and you should be expected to perform. And what do I mean by that? There are so many different products out there that you could expect to be, uh, you know, interfacing with, whether it be a financial product, it can be an artificial intelligence product, it can be a um, safety da data security project, cybersecurity project, et cetera. Um, so your mind needs to be so, ex so expansive um, that you're constantly learning things. And I think just through that natural progression of your career, the more that you know and the more that you learn, you'll be able to kind of flex those different muscles and, and be creative um, by combining those things to be able to solve future problems. But inherently, yes. Uh, because sometimes you even might have to get your hands dirty and design something to make like a mock-up or blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It is really cool because one thing that I've been trying to do, especially at my platform, um, is just exposing the opportunities for creatives in the technology field. Because oftentimes when we hear, you know, oh, you're working for a software company or a tech startup, you think you have to be super technical, you know, good at numbers, know how to do, you know, software engineering and all of that, right? But there's a lot of space in this industry for creatives. And so me being a creative myself, and when I, you know, started doing more research, I realized, wow, there's a lot of different roles and different opportunities to really be able to flex that creativity. It's just something that I feel like we don't really talk about that much. That's really cool. So how did you, how did you find um, the level of creativity while you were doing your research? Did you find that it was acceptable? Did you find it was more than what you expected? Did you find like it was less than what you expected? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it was definitely more because the, how I got into, into even like working in tech, so I've been a full-time entrepreneur and content creator since 2018. And earlier this year, I met a, well, I guess last, in the end of last year, earlier this year, I met a founder of a tech startup. And I was just doing some one-off content projects, helping him out. And so he ended up bringing me on, on a contract as a fractional CMO for his company. And then that's when I realized, wow, there's actually a lot of space for creatives in, in the field. And so I started doing more research and I started learning about you know, product owners and product managers and um, obviously the marketing space, you know, content marketing. And there's just so many other things, AI um, and machine learning. Like there's so many roles that you can be in where you can still use that creativity and that imagination that comes with it and being able to, you know, do research and people who love learning, you know, there's so much, so much space for us. And so um, I was definitely surprised, you know, because I thought, oh, to be in tech, I have to go be in cybersecurity or have to, you know, be a software developer. And that's just not yeah. me. Like, that's just not me at all. And so it's really cool to see that there is a lot of opportunity for us. Yeah, fact. It's so dope. It's so dope. Just the wide range of opportunities that, you know, someone can find themselves in. Uh, for me, you know, I had uh, a, a very varied life, right? Like, I'm not somebody who comes from money. My, my dad is a barber, my mom's a nurse. We weren't really like well off in that sense, right? I've had a job since third grade. I, I was always a hard- Third worker. grade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Worked at my, my, my father's barbershop since I was in third grade, up until seventh grade. And then from there, you know, I always kept the side hustle, you know, whether it was like selling uh, DVDs of burn movies that I had. Or <laughs> whatever the case may be. And I just always had that spirit of just being creative and how can I address a, 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 a solution? How can I address a problem and you know be the provider of a solution? So I think it was just this innate, you know, sort of characteristic that I always had that even drove me to a field like this. But it wasn't until I was exposed to it 
that I even knew that I could do it, right? I remember, you know, some years ago, I was I was sleeping on my uncle's floor on an air mattress, uh, making like zero dollars doing Postmates when it first came out. Um, and I had essentially just always put in a lot of work learning and, you know, thriving off of being curious and, and wanting to, to do more. So I think stretching outside and pushing outside of your, your comfort zone and those boundaries is something we often hear. But when you really truly do that, the world opens up and the things that you're exposed to are, are just beautiful. Um, so I, I would implore everybody to just really, really bet on themselves and, and just be heads down sometimes grow, figure out what you're really passionate about, or just want to learn and just, just go after it. Like the world is your oyster for real. Absolutely. And that exposure is so key, you know, because you don't know what you don't know, you know? So if you don't even know something exists, you can't even do research on it. Um, so being exposed to just different types of career paths and different types of companies and different technologies, it can just open up in a whole new world for you. hundred percent. And you, one of the one of the, the the things that I always had gone back and forth on was, you know, do I need to be a programmer? Do I need to like get a, a computer science degree and blah blah blah? And I haven't really, you know, I'm almost eight years into my career, nine years into my career, and I haven't need, I haven't had to use any of those things to get to where I am. But those are things that interest me. So just the the delineation of, you know, do I need it or do I not need it is, no, I don't need it to be successful and do the things that I need to do. So I think a lot of people really do need to hear that, that, you know, STEM is great, but at the same time, there is room, like you were saying, for the, for the non-technical, for the creatives to really make an impact, right, and leave their mark on a lot of these big projects and at the new, you know, frontier of technology, right, with Solana and all these other Web3 uh, entities out there and blockchains, it's, it's crazy the amount of opportunity that is out there for you as long as you show up and, you know, just start asking questions like I do every day. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm sure, especially in that Web3 space, because it is so new, I'm sure that the career opportunities are probably like ever growing, right? Or even even if you don't want to necessarily work for a company, but the entrepreneurial opportunities as well in the space is it's ever growing. Yeah, yeah, that's so so interesting. Um, I myself, right? I think is am a testament to just like the fluidity of the opportunities that are always out there in this space. Uh, I started off while I was still at my last job in, the, in Web2, um, I was a part of this thing called a DAO, right? Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is essentially just a group of people rallying around an, uh, a mission, if you will. So it's like a company, but it's not really a corporate structure at all, right? It's like going to work with your buddies and friends and you know, y'all just putting work in to do something. And I contributed to that for free in my spare time, really loved it. I got to interface with a lot of big companies like Coinbase and Polygon and blah, 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 things like that. And um, eventually this place, this this entity had released a, a token, right? And I had got a allocation of that token just from contributing and I made money, right? Like I thought that that was so cool that, you know, I was, able to be rewarded for just being an active participant, but not really having to go through the process of like being hired or anything like that, right? So yeah, there are grants that are out there. If you have an idea that you wanna present, you can go and research those, apply for them. And if you can contribute to these entities and whatnot and get awarded a grant for your time or your idea, I think that's amazing. Um, and. A lot of these people out here that are contributing to Web3, they they welcome you know a lot of collaboration. A lot of things is open source, so you don't even have to ask permission in a lot of instances 
to contribute to a, a project or a company that you might really love, right? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so much opportunity there. And I know that um, you moved into the entrepreneurial space. And I'm definitely curious to hear about how you even got started with that. I know you mentioned that you were with um, Metaplex and then you experienced a layoff and then you moved into just really building up your own thing. And so, um, you know, that's something that's very, I don't say very common, but I know in the technology space, that's something that a lot of people do worry about because layoffs are not something that's super uncommon. So like, yeah. how did you navigate that and what made you um, go into starting your own consulting business? It was really uh, necessity, right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, oh man, I really wanna do this. I really want, I, it was kind of like I have to do this. That was the real of it. Um, I had founded a business before and that was something that I wanted to do. And that was in real estate. Uh, it was a service business, like scanning buildings. If you ever saw those 3D tours, um, I, I did those. And so in this instance, what was different about it was when I got laid off, I didn't accept any severance, right? So I didn't have any severance. And when I tried to go through unemployment, uh, there was an issue and I couldn't, I couldn't get an unemployment at all. So I was essentially running off of my savings. So I started to, you know, calculate things out, do do do. All right, this I'm burning through my savings and my savings is, is pretty much gone. And by the grace of God, you know, I have built up such a network just from every day I'm talking to builders, founders, um, developers, etc. just reaching out, seeing how I can help, be a resource, and I'm talking to people and um, it was just so crazy how things worked out because what had happened was, you know, I put my story out there that I had experienced this, this layoff and um, somebody reached out, they were like, I need you. I need you, bro, I need you. I was like, let's talk, right? And so through that, this is somebody I had interfaced before, just you know, talk free, help them out a little bit. And, you know, they were like, this is the idea I have. This is where I'm at. I know you're a product manager and, you know, I need help getting this from zero to one. Can we work together? Yeah, <laughs> we can work together. So I did what I needed to do, get my paperwork set up for my business. And, um, you know, from there, I was, I was off to the races working with this one client for months. Right, we had established this this relationship for months, and then from there, I got another one, then I got another one, and you know, things happen, things happen. Now, now I'm at this stage where you know I feel like I'm I'm really ready to get back out there and you know contribute my time to a company you know in a in a more permanent state because like I said, this this business wasn't something that. You know, I had dreamed of doing, or it was motivated to do um, of my own accord, our own volition. It was, I got to keep the lights on, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's actually really interesting because I always talk about how important networking is in building those relationships, and I think a lot of times we go into networking as, okay, who can I meet and what can I get from them? you know, instead of going into it with like a value first approach. And sometimes you'll be cultivating relationships and it might be months, like you said, or even years before you even see any anything come of that relationship. I love how, you know, you were doing that and then when an opportunity came at the perfect time for you, you know, so I think that's just really goes to show how important it is to be building relationships throughout your career. 100%. If if you know, I was if I was timid, I'm an introvert at heart, right? Like I, I love my long time, I love my my home and <laughs> you know, chilling. Uh, but I would wholly say that if it wasn't for my ability to network and just talk to people and make those connections, that I probably would have been evicted from my place long ago. I would be, you know, somewhere in a position that I did not want to be in, right? Right. Those relationships 100% turned into dollars. 
and that wasn't something that I was, you know, seeking out or, you know, forcing out of people. It was just something that was organically um, in the making and happening for me long before I even knew that I needed to lean on these people and, and help them so they can lean on me as well. So it was it was very it was very beautiful, and you know the the thing that I I always love to do, even still, is help people. So right in in Web three, um, and the Solana chain ex explicitly, I had started these free office hours, right, just my own time, and I welcome anybody who was a project creator builder, founder, what have you, experienced or not, to meet with me uh, every Tuesday, I think I said it for, and they could, you know, list their problems that they were having in their business with their product, et cetera, and they would fill out this intake form, we would talk, we would meet, and, you know, I would, in that session, help them the best that I could address that issue or formulate this plan or, you know, ideate on this thing, and I met so many amazing people through that, right? And it was about 34 projects that I had helped in the span of two months. And they were from, you know, single founders to teams that had, you know, nine figures that they had touched with their project, which is crazy that those type of people, you know, can come to me as, as this individual and, you know, really be attentive and, and, and really, um, receive what I'm saying to them. So I I can't I can't say enough of how important it is to network and you know if it's in your heart to you know just give back and be a resource with whatever resources that you can provide, I would I would I would implore you to try to and, and see how it goes for you and the, the people you touch, right? Because they, they need it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, networking has been such a huge, a huge component to even my career as well, you know, so mm -hmm. it's definitely worth, you know, I think, you know, giving that value to people. A lot of times, especially in today's world, um, we go off the notion of like, you know, you can't even talk to people unless they pay an invoice. And sometimes um, I feel like it's okay to actually build those relationships without having a price tag on it. Um, because you never know what's going to come out of those conversations. So I, I really love that. 100%, 100%, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what, was an, what was an example of you uh, really benefiting from network yourself? Like, what, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, the software company that I work for now, actually. Wow. So um, I met someone on, like, Facebook or social media, you know, as we do. And it's someone that's just been in my network for a while. I've met her at a couple events. We worked on a couple projects together over the last few years. And she works at this software company. And I had reached out to her a few months ago. And I'm like, hey, you know, I'm trying to transition out of marketing into a different role. And I was like, you know, is there any, you know, tips or anything that you can just, like, give me? Because I'm having a really hard time. Like, I was applying for over 100 positions. And I just wasn't getting any feedback at all. Um, and so she's like, yeah, you know, do this, this, and this to your resume. And I did that. And then a couple weeks later, um, I was like going through the interview process for a few companies and she called me and she's like, Hey, the, the software company that I work for is actually looking for a position. I was like, if you're interested, I'll send your resume to our, like our HR hiring manager and we'll just see what happens. So I ended up getting the, getting the interview with them and obviously going through the process and, and accepting an offer from them because, you know, she recommended me to it. So like we built that relationship over the last few years, you know, and obviously I didn't know what would come of it, but now I've been able to, you know, get the role that I have right now because of that relationship. That's amazing. That's a, that's a testimony right there. That's dope. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I always tell people, like, no matter what you do, because I'm also an introvert as well, you know, but it's worth, like, getting out of your comfort zone a little bit and building those relationships because it's been a huge factor in just my, my career and even within my business for these last few years. 100%. And, and even this, you know, this yeah. us talking and, and communicating here today uh, for, you know, your viewers it, it's, it's one of those things that I think of you know practicing what you preach right because Absolutely. we can easily just follow each other on twitter and not be the end of it but 
you know, now we're here, right? I love that. Absolutely, yes. And I'm all about just sharing, you know, sharing my network, sharing information. That's why um, I wanted to start up this series on my channel. Um, because, you know, I don't know everything, obviously, you know, especially in the technology field. And I was like, there's so much that we can expose people to. Um, and so that's why, you know, I'm really grateful that you even came on and just shared your experience. So I'm sure that there's some part of it that somebody will be able to relate to or grab a piece of information from um, that can potentially help them within their journey and uh, within their, you know, career process. So I really am appreciative of that. You're, you're welcome. And I appreciate you having me. Um, I, I just... I would say to anybody who is looking for change, right? Go out and seek it, you know, go, go expose yourself to things that you might not have known that were out there by talking to people who are in positions that you might not be familiar with, watching videos on YouTube, reading some things, educating yourselves on the unknown. Uh, because from there, once you start, you'll be able to pull that thread and what you unwind will just be a beautiful, you know, mess of a whole new world. And if there are any people who want to learn about Web3 and what it's like to be a product manager, um, I'm super happy to talk about those things. One, I love Web3 because where else could you have a, a cell phone plan, you know, that's 4G, 5G data that you only pay $5 a month for due to the power of blockchain, right? Where else could you, you know, facilitate a contract? And that company is called Helium, by the way. So if you're in Miami, uh, they, they just started up. You can, you can go ahead and get that, that $5 cell phone plan right now. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a people-powered Uber and Lyft alternative called Teleport. There is a freelancing platform called Lancer where you don't have to wait for people to pay you. As soon as the job is done, the smart contract will automatically pay you out. So there's no chasing down customers or anything of that nature. And I think that a lot of these different companies and entities that are being sprung up and built and bootstrapped by these amazing people um, are going to change our world. And that's why I just, I'm a big fan and believer. Um, and then on the product management side, help people be organizationally efficient, help solve customer issues and problems, and then also just build cool stuff, right? So if those things interest you, I'm, I'm here to help. I love that. I love that. The possibilities are endless. Um, they are, and I hope that if you, you know, if you're someone who is watching this, you know, do your research, look up the different companies that are out there um, as far as Web3 and some of these other technologies and, um, I think a lot of creative people would enjoy learning about the product manager role, you know, so definitely if that sounds like you, you know, just do your research and see, you know, you never know what's out there. And again, Deshaun, I really appreciate you for coming on and just sharing your story, um, adding value. And I definitely, you know, I know that someone's going to really benefit from hearing that. Thank you so much. And I hope so.